Hi everyone, my disembodied voice is here to talk to you a little bit about disabilities and how it will likely relate to your work. I promise to make this as interesting as possible. Let's start with some facts about disability. People with disabilities represent one of the largest minority groups in the United States, which is interesting because disabled is the one minority group that you can join at just about any time. Your chances of membership actually start to climb faster and faster after you hit the age of 50. According to a recent U.S. census, about one in five Americans has some kind of disability, and about half of those have severe disabilities. So the likelihood that you've made it this far in your life without encountering anyone with some sort of disability, whether severe or not, visible or not, is a practical impossibility. And if somehow you've ma made it this far, your lucky streak is over because you're listening to the voice of someone who is legally blind. Allow me to give you a bit of background on my disability. If Sally hasn't told you already, I was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa, a degenerative eye condition, at age 11. The symptoms of RP can vary from person to person, but its most common ones are difficulty adjusting to light and loss of peripheral vision. You can simulate this last one by looking through straws or cardboard tubes to block out all but the center of your visual field. Because it's a degenerative condition, it tends to get worse as time goes on, and I'll likely be completely blind by the time I reach 40 years old. In preparation for this, my parents arranged to have my public school district bring teachers uh, who would train me in reading Braille, using a cane, and other independent skills on top of my regular classwork. Growing up with my vision problem, I noticed that there were a lot of people who felt bad for me. Granted, not being able to drive sucks sometimes, but there's a persisting stigma that surrounds disability as something that's uh, sorrowful or shameful. The, the, that shame or sadness, however, doesn't come from within. People with disabilities, even those gained suddenly, tend to be just as happy as anyone else. So if having a disability is actually more common than naturally blonde hair, which it is, by the way, why is it that having a disability isn't treated as just another fact of life that the human and the human body that we can't control? This leads me to the topic of how to treat a person with a disability. The selfish part of me wants to tell you all to embrace your blind overlords and prepare yourselves as willing subjects of my imminent dictatorship, but it all, in all actuality, it boils down to three simple rules. Be knowledgeable, be polite, and be accommodating. Being knowledgeable about disability means knowing as much as you can about different disabilities as possible. You can often get by with just knowing the disabilities of the people you will encounter on a daily basis, but you have to be prepared to reassess and learn new things on the spot. If you are working with someone who has a food allergy, you want to make sure you don't want to put their allergen in cookies and hand them out at work. If someone has a vision problem, don't rearrange their furniture like my parents did when I was misbehaving as a child. Being polite is as easy as not assuming things about a person with a disability. Just because person one needed help moving ten feet from their chair to the next, it doesn't mean that person two with a similar disability needs the same help. Also, don't assume uh, someone wants your help either. Uh, when I was in high school, we lived just a short walking distance from a little martial arts school that I used for exercise and to keep from getting too bored. We had spent the lesson on learning joint locks surrounding the wrist and forearm, and I was waiting with my service dog, Mikey, to cross a street. Uh, someone came up behind me and grabbed my arm, muttering something like, here, let me help. Out of reflex, I kind of accidentally put the guy in an arm lock and tossed him to the ground. Uh, but whether someone appears disabled or not, grabbing their arm on a street corner is just creepy, so don't do it. The last rule is to be accommodating, which is where the actual helping the person comes in. The best way to do this is just to ask the person if they need help, and if they say yes, don't just do whatever you think is best, but ask them how they would like your help. When you have a disability, independence is nice, but when you can't be completely independent, it's best to shoot for something called dependent autonomy. This means that while the person may be depending on you to make something happen, they're still making the choice as to what's happening. If someone needs help figuring out what to eat, Dependent autonomy would be reading their choices to them and allowing them to choose for themselves. That's really it. And if you really wanted to, you could boil these three rules into an even simpler rule of don't be a jerk. Sadly, there will always be those who break this rule, like the Burger King in River Falls. 
If Sally hasn't told you already, I used to live in River Falls. Hi, Mom. And I was within walking distance to the Burger King over the uh, over near the bowling alley. Occasionally, I would walk there for lunch. Uh, but on one occasion, I noticed there was something odd about the Braille on the doors. It wasn't Braille. To make matters worse, when I tried to bring this to the attention of someone on staff, a manager uh, tried to tell me that he wasn't aware that the bumps meant anything, which is about as rude as telling someone who is deaf that sign language is just a fancy way of waving at each other. It's a legitimate thing, it's real, and telling me that a part of my disability and my disability's culture is somehow invalid is definitely the height of disrespect. In case you don't know what Braille is, it's a code that uses raised dots to convert a written language into something that is tactile, something someone can feel. Each Braille character is made up of a cell containing six places for dots to be, and depending on which dots have uh, which uh, which dots are in which spots, you have different characters in Braille. The thing about Braille is you can't really write it by hand. The dots have to be in certain places relative to one another to make coherent letters. What was on the Burger King sign was some epoxy droplets that someone had dripped in what they hoped was the right place. But the letters kind of ran together, and so the men's sign read M, and the women's sign read WUM M. By law, businesses need to provide Braille labels for their door signs any time they provide labels for people with vision. By not having correct or even legible Braille, a blind guy might accidentally walk into the women's room, which would be embarrassing for the guy and startling for anyone in the restroom, to say the least. Further, if I've just eaten Burger King food, I'm going to need a bathroom to deal with the customary case of BK diarrhea, and if the bathroom is inaccessible to me, I, as a blind man, am not being allowed the authentic Burger King experience. There are other laws surrounding disability as well, by the way. In 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed and made effective law in 1992, and more was added to the law in 2008. In short, the ADA means you can't discriminate against people with disabilities. However, people with disabilities, much like racial minorities or women, are not completely free of unequal treatment, despite the presence of laws attempting to stop unequal treatment. New buildings routinely fail inspections by ADA compliance officials, and the number of people with disabilities unable to find employment, despite being just as qualified, remains depressingly high. In recent times, however, some of the most notable examples of unfair treatment surround the use of service animals. I had a service dog for eight years, and Mikey, who has saved my life more times than I can ever repay, was often unfairly questioned when we were out and about. According to the ADA, anywhere the general public is allowed to go, a service dog, which is defined as a dog specifically trained to provide a service to a person with a disability, is allowed to accompany its handler. That means restaurants, planes, movie theaters, public walkways, and so on. Where I went, Mikey went. The problem there comes when people don't understand that service dogs and their handlers are protected under the ADA and attempt to prevent the handlers from accessing their businesses. I've had this happen to me a couple of times, and it's upsetting every time. Uh, when I tell people about my experiences, they ask often if there's a license or certificate that I can show to prove that I had a service dog under the ADA, and not just a pet in a fancy harness. The answer to that is, sadly, no. While a lot of service dog training programs do hand out certificates of graduation, none of them are officially recognized by the U.S. Department of Justice the way that a driver's license is recognized by the Department of Transportation. While I think I'd be happy to have a card to wave and just be done with any questions, the fact is that other people with disabilities don't need to prove that they're disabled. Nobody in a wheelchair is forced to prove that they can't walk, and nobody with diabetes is forced to prove that they can't eat the triple fudge brownie cake for dessert. This issue is made worse by people who don't understand service dog law by trying to fraudulently pass off their own pets as service dogs. Yes, this happens, and has been getting worse since 2012. People will make harnesses, jackets, patches, fake licenses, and so on, just to bring their dog with them, or claim that the dog provides emotional support and companionship as their service, which is specifically recognized by the ADA as not enough to qualify as a service dog. So when these animals misbehave, 
barking, being disruptive at best, and attacking people and real service dogs at worst, and yes, this has happened, it creates a distrust for people who actually need the service dogs. You might be wondering about how a business can tell if a service dog is real or not, and there are two questions the employees and managers of the business can ask. Number one, is this a service animal? And two, what services is it trained to provide? And you have to ask it that way. You can't ask for a license. You can't ask for a demonstration of the dog's abilities. You can't try to test the animal by tempting it with food to distract it. And you can't inquire about the person's specific disability. If they say the dog is there for emotional support and companionship, you can inform them that the ADA does not recognize emotional support and therapy animals as the same as service dogs and ask them to politely to leave but not before offering the same services to the person without the presence of the dog. When it comes to service dogs in your workplace, just know there's one really simple rule about how to act. Don't pet, feed, or distract the dog in any way. That's really it. When you do, you are preventing the animal from performing its service, which may actually be putting the person's life in genuine danger. You're not responsible for the care of the dog, and if the person is unable to care for the dog themselves, they're supposed to either return the dog to the training program, where it's, you know, often uh, put into a new career, or uh, to find a new home for the dog. Um, Mikey lives with my parents now because uh, when he got old enough, he couldn't work for me anymore. So he's getting fat and gray and happy, and I'm very happy that he's getting spoiled and misbehaving for them just as much as I likely did at age 11. Um, as a side note, if you see someone with a service dog, greet the person first. You'd seem like a jerk if you greeted a wheelchair before the person in it, so don't do the same for a service animal team. Remember the rule, don't be a jerk. It applies here, too. If you have any questions about disability, such as what breeds are most often used for service dogs, I encourage you to send me an email at blind underscore devotion zero eight at yahoo.com or through my blog at www.unsighthtful.org. That's www.unsightful.org. Like, insightful, but unsightful. Yes, it's a play on words, and I put a quarter in my pun jar for it. Thank you for your time and your patience. I hope I was able to make this interesting, if not completely memorable. And I also wanted to thank all of you for the care and work that you are going to be providing for the people you'll be working with as part of this profession. Um, you know, I was really lucky to grow up with a mom who was a nurse, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be taught the value of people who care for others on purpose. And so, because of that, thank you very much. <laughs>